behalf of mom and the family, thank you for being here today to honor dad's life. My name is Joshua Brooks. I'm a son-in-law to David and Shanna, husband to Amanda, and it is my privilege to share with you this evening a tribute on behalf of the siblings and spouses, some of whom took some time to put their memories and reflections of dad on paper, which I'd like to read to you now. Amanda writes this, Dad loved me by spending time with me. He read books to me before bed. He taught me how to play basketball. One of my core memories growing up is coming home in second grade and telling Dad I needed him to help me train because I was convinced that I could win the turkey trot at school. Because whoever won got to bring home a whole turkey. I was not athletically gifted at all, and yet I remember Dad running with me around our neighborhood to help me train. Parenthetically, I did not come close to winning the turkey trot. <laughs> Dan writes, my dad was my hero, someone that I always strive to be like someday. His compassion, patience, understanding, and thoughtfulness has always been there, even through tough times and long distances. The lessons he taught me, even when he didn't think I was watching, is something I will strive to pass on to my kids as they grow up and start their own families. Kayla writes, Dad always put family first. Even after a long day of working from 4.30 in the morning to 7 p.m., he would wrestle up the energy to make time for his family when he came home. Mom would sit on their bed as he changed out of his suit and tie, and they would talk about each other's day. Then he would sit mom to take her nightly bath and spend time with us kids in his black and white striped Adidas sweatpants and an old Emerald Heights gray pullover sweatshirt, <laughs> helping us do our homework, cleaning up the kitchen after dinner. Dad was the definition of a family. Gabe writes, Dad was a hopeless romantic. I remember Mom calling Dad both the love of her life. And growing up, I saw Dad's love for Mom, too. As every month we went out, he'd surprise her with a bouquet of flowers. Every time. Parenthetically, this coming June, they would have celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Honey, Dan's wife writes, I married into the family, but Dad always made me feel like his own daughter. On the last birthday card he gave me, he wrote, quote, happy birthday to my daughter. I miss him so much. My kids miss him so much. Austin looked up to him. If you asked Austin who's the smartest person he knows, he would say Papa. Henry always asked for his Poppy because he said Poppy is his best friend. Dad truly cared about people and loved his family. David, Kayla's husband, writes, if there's anything I can say about Dad, it's that he loved Mom, Nani, all the way to the very end of his life. His drive to take care of her was immeasurable. Amanda remembers Dad championing hard work and doing whatever was needed to get any job done. From cutting and stacking wood to building swing sets to transporting sod from the old Olympic High School football field to our backyard, Dad never <laughs> avoided <laughs> <laughs> always did it with a smile. Amanda recalled when Emerald Heights was almost finished. The delivery of the desks, though, was delayed, and so Dad offered to pay me and my friends to unload and set up hundreds of desks. We worked until midnight, but we got it done, and Dad was right there working alongside us the whole time. Dan writes, if you knew my dad, then in some way, either large or small, I know he had a positive effect on your life because of his benevolence. But I got to experience Dad's benevolence every day. Whether it was him just stopping by to help with yard work, or offering to babysit, or spending hours planning our next all-family vacation, Dad was the essence of benevolence. One of Kayla's favorite memories was their dad and daughter dates on Thursday nights as a teenager. Kayla writes, we would melt butter on the stove to drizzle on our popcorn in preparation for the newest episode of 24. <laughs> An intense TV thriller about a tough, stubborn man named Jack Bauer, who was a U.S. counterterrorist agent. One of Jack Bauer's famous lines was, I'm a federal agent, Jack Bauer, 
and today is the longest day of my life. <laughs> when my second child, Noah, was having sleepless nights as a toddler, I'd tell Dad how tired I was with two kids and so little sleep. And I remember Dad reciting that quote to me. I'm federal agent Jack Howard. <laughs> <laughs> he also told me how he stayed up late watching movies with me on his chest when I was a baby and wouldn't sleep. He told me, quote, the days are long and tiring, but life is short. Take in those moments with your family and have another cup of coffee. In John 7, 33, Jesus said, I am with you only a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. Dad was only here for a short time, but I know he's now in heaven with Jesus. Gabe writes, Dad has always been the backbone of our family, but he also had a goofy side of him. Where one minute you're walking with him out of Costco, and the next minute you find him riding in the back of the shopping cart. <laughs> Amanda writes, not everything in Dad's life was easy. Dad knew about challenges. There were hard things in life that he walked through. And yet Dad allowed the Lord to use those trials and challenges to make him look more like Jesus, and to give wise encouragement to others going through their own challenges. Last year, and it's a very difficult challenge in our lives, I would text my dad and ask him to pray for me. And my dad would always write back and say, yes, we are praying for you. But he wouldn't only say that. He would also remind me of what the Lord had been teaching him through trials. And he would say, man, that God is sovereign, and you can trust him. He is with you, and he will never leave you, nor forsake you. Dad empathized with me. But he didn't let me wallow in self-pity. He had experienced the Lord working through trials in his life, and he reminded me of that. Dan sums up his reflections by highlighting his gratitude for the job that Dad did in setting him up to be a family man that he would be proud of. I will be forever thankful for that dad. I love him this one. One of the images that is fixed in Kayla's mind is of Dad being the man behind the camera always being intentional to take the photos of all the family members, living his best life with his wife and family, that was my dad. Gabe sums up his reflections by calling, recalling how dad spread his love around like butter, touching so many lives, noting that, quote, everywhere my dad went, he always left that place smiling with a warm heart. Amanda concludes her reflections with this. The most important thing you should know about my dad was that he loved the Lord. Jesus was the inspiration behind everything he did. My dad knew he had been rescued and saved by Jesus, and that is what Lord did to serve. In so many ways, he cared for the people in his world. He cared for the students. He cared for the teachers. He cared for colleagues in the community. He cared for his family. He loved mom well. He loved his kids. He loved his grandkids. And he loved his Savior. In his presence, he is now dwelling with fullness of joy. Anticipating with us that great day, Jesus, will be reunited in paradise to enjoy him and each other forever. And I can't wait to see you on that day. in our public school system. 32 years in the Central Kitsap School District. 27 years of being a highly successful teacher and principal motivated his career progression that was significantly influenced by a bachelor's degree in special education and mathematics. So master's in school administration, and most importantly, he would have been successful in any vocation he chose. He was selected as the Washington Elementary Pencil of the Year in 2005 and simultaneously selected as a National Distinguished Elementary Pencil. I invite you to look around the room. Notice who is in attendance. Familiar faces, students and children, 
extraordinary educators, outstanding support staff, talented teachers, leaders of professional organizations, school administrators, elected officials, spiritual leaders, community members, business owners, parents, and grandparents, and most prominently, the McVicker family. With deepest respect and admiration, thank you for sharing David with us for over four decades, and a very special thanks to you, Jim. This facility is still relatively new, holds nearly a thousand people. Its existence wasn't by accident. It symbolized the talents of the person surrounding this evening. This evening's setting also reflects how much David cared for our school district, and in turn, how much you care for David. The gathering of many people representing so many different abilities <coughs> and significant levels of responsibility, all working in tandem and dedicated to our children and our community. United this evening because of a caring, resolute leader. Right person, right time, right skills, admirable personal qualities, embedded in leadership that is the glue that binds organizations school systems and communities. David is that person. Take a moment, please, and think about David. Think about one or two words or concepts that reflect those personal qualities that you associate with him. And I gather that his presence here, that you know David in many different ways, and some know him very, very well. I'm asking your indulgence and everyone's assistance in honor of David as I read a list of skills and personal qualities. And as you hear my words, if you arrive at similar words in your own thoughts about David, or the words remind you of David, either just now or perhaps another time, please stand silently and remain standing. And for the McVicker family, I ask you to please remain seated. And I promise if you stand up and be silent, I will not call on you to say anything. Empathetic, driven by his heart, present in the moment, welcoming, gracious, and supportive, leading with integrity, friend, mentor, great ability to poke fun at himself, <laughs> student focused, truly cares about people, loves children, He's patient, brilliant, subject matter expert, experienced educator, acute listener, willing to compromise, sense of humor, a uniter, respectful to everyone, leads by example, deserving of admiration and respect, seeks feedback, trustworthy, highly effective principal and superintendent, champion problem solver, great teacher, reflects credit on others, deflects personal recognition, wonderful communicator, impeccable ethics, community around the tremendous impact David has on so many individuals, a vivid reflection of our community-wide sentiment. Thank you, and please be seated. More than four decades of excellence impacting not just 100 or 10,000 students, parents, school staff, and community members, but exerting influence eventually impacting hundreds of thousands of our children, citizens in our community, and other people throughout Washington and the United States. David's influence included filling leadership positions in professional organizations in Washington and across our nation, interacting with elected officials at all levels of government to include senators and representatives of the U.S. Congress. More than 15 years ago, during historically bleak fiscal times to include steep school revenue reductions, David crafted an initial resource plan for our district's future extending into the current decade, which yielded part of what you see here today. This facility and the district ride renovation and new construction expansion remains the envy throughout our state. At the same time, his focus remained on the students, Jobs were preserved, 
Our community continued to pass school funding initiatives while withstanding the effects of the Second Great Depression. There was also a fun fact, David, and no matter what position he held inside the school district, he played a major role in the collective bargaining process. And as the story goes during one of the many negotiation sessions, our guardian of school district dollars was willing to be taken hostage, held for ransom, and directed to stand in the corner of the room with a brown bag over his head. <laughs> and I do believe that there's photo evidence to be able to prove that point. There was never any two tasks difficult for David. He not only loved his own work and as the assistant superintendent for business, and the superintendent too, he loved to do the work that belonged to other colleagues. <clears throat> David defined his lane of responsibility, especially when he was our assistant superintendent, as a multi-lane freeway that included teaching and learning, human relations, communications, operations, and any other major part of Central Kitsap School District, including the superintendent's office. A few of Central Office colleagues of David's awarded him a car turn signal light in an effort to remind him to at least signal and lane change in advance <laughs> so the rest of us could either slam on the brakes or get out of the way. <laughs> this endearing quality is known as unbridled enthusiasm and initiative. I personally spent hundreds of hours with David, one-on-one -on -one problem solving at a whiteboard, strategizing, planning the future. Our discussion also included non-contentious and easy to solve problems like advancing student achievement by instituting an all-day kindergarten without any additional funding. How to close two of our oldest schools in our school district. Finding an additional $30 million to close the budget deficit and suing the United States Department of Education. And building new schools, remodeling infrastructure worth over a billion dollars, and dealing with the biggest financial crisis in the United States since 1920. He had a way of doing meetings where I would present a problem solving idea. He would tilt his head to either the left or the right, sometimes smile, and sometimes he'd glare. <laughs> As the months passed, and while he never said a word about the meaning of the head tilt, the tilting increased based upon his always respectful and calm word reactions to my ideas, I finally translated the tilt to the right. Man, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and the tilt to the left, you obviously lost your sense of reality once again. <laughs> Around eight years together, his head never stopped moving. <laughs> His courage and strength and conviction was extraordinary. The takeaway from all of us is never fail to take out the position in a respectful way, but when a decision is made, a united front is always stronger. <coughs> Keep your focus on students and what truly matters to them as opposed to what matters to our adults. In the context of selfless service, as we go forward today, in our own professional lives, or perhaps in our own personal lives as well, reflecting better than others and not drawing attention to yourself is an admirable quality. During times of disagreement, I think about what David would do or what he would want the outcome to be if he was still with us. As Dr. Seuss would say, Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. This evening is a celebration of an extraordinary individual. Please join me in showing your appreciation for David, for David's family, for without the family's loving support, the effects of what we see. being David's pastor for the last 12 years. And I'm so grateful that the Vicar family has invited me to be a part of 
at this ceremony. Uh, I asked our founding pastor if he had any words to say, and uh, let me read this here on my wife, watch. Uh, Bill Robinson, who is in the room, wrote, my wife and I loved growing up, growing up together with the McVickers. Their love for this community and our family and the church I pastor was a constant inspiration to us. Dave had a special place in our hearts, and he will be profoundly missed. I think I can speak for all of the pastors. I, I'll just speak for myself, but I think I can speak for all of us. That Dave was the great white well that we were never able to land on our elbow board. And uh, <laughs> many times I went to him to ask him if he would be willing to serve, and he'd say, not at this time. One twelve just seems to suit what I know about the life of David McVicker, not just because it ties to his life thematically, but interestingly enough, in Hebrew, it's an acrostic. The first letter of the word begins with the A in the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph, the Beit, the next line begins with a Beit, the next line after that begins with a Gimel, which is kind of the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And that just seemed to me to be especially suited for someone who gave his life for education, seeing young minds to be opened up and to learn. So Psalm 112, this is from Robert Alter's translation, a wonderful Hebrew scholar. I'll just do the first uh, couple of letters. Aleph, happy the man who fears the Lord. Faith, his commands he keenly desires. Gimel, a great figure in the land his seed shall be. Dark with justice, for he shall never stumble. An eternal remembrance the just man shall be. From evil rumor he shall not fear. His heart is firm. He trusts in the Lord. His heart is staunch. He shall not fear. So he sees the defeat of his foes. He disperses. He gives to the needy. His righteousness stands forever. His horn shall be raised in glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but when I think about the life of David McVicker, happy, gracious, merciful, just, generous, steadfast, courageous, righteous. This picture in Psalm 112 of a man of integrity, I would suggest to you that these are the ABCs of David McVicker's life, or at least the A with fake illness. <laughs> the first time that I got a chance to meet David came during one of the most stressful moments of my life. I had just moved down I was 38 years old, I had a two-year-old and a six-month-old, and I needed wisdom, because I was facing a very stressful situation, and someone suggested to me that I should get in touch with David, and we had a meeting with a couple of other guys, and I've only had this happen to me a couple of times in my life, but that calm, cool demeanor of David and particularly the deep well of wisdom that just comes out of adversity, that wisdom that he offered, it settled my soul, settled my anxiety. I remember leaving that first meeting saying to myself, if I get to pastor people like him, this stress will have been worth it. Clearly that cool, clear-headed wisdom was in, forged in part in the fires of school administration, <laughs> right? I, I don't think I'm talking out of school here. Squabbles and strike. If there was any person I've known who could take a licking and keep on ticking, it was David McVicker. You might say that the very room that we're gathering in tonight is a testimony to his endurance, to his courage, and to his integrity. But I also believe that that calm and rational wisdom I, I, I don't believe I know, came from his rest and his steadfast trust in his Lord Jesus Christ. He loved the Lord Jesus Christ, which is no small accomplishment for the son of a Methodist minister. We Methodists, or we ministers' kids, can sometimes have a rough go of it. 
Because as a kid, you grew up kind of seeing behind the curtain of a church life. And sometimes it's kind of messy. Sometimes people who say that they're Christian, it's not necessarily so. Uh, they can be a little bit mean sometimes. And you as a kid, you grow up kind of seeing that. But praise be to God, David didn't lose his faith. His faith persevered. In fact, I would argue that David went on to become a minister. Like Isaiah, I believe that he heard the call of the Lord. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I, Isaiah, said, Here am I, send me. But unlike Isaiah's call to speak to a people who always hear but never understand, who always see but never perceive, David's call was kind of the opposite. To help people to understand. To help them perceive. To instruct kids to know their ABCs, but also know that there were wonderful adults like him on their side. Adults that were cheering them on as they endeavored to achieve their highest potential and their dreams. And this unique military community for a bunch of kids who get moved around from place to place, that Central Kitsap School District might be a respite, an oasis of stability and care. David's children told me that the one thing that lit up his eyes more than anything else was to see a child get something for the first time. To have that kind of knowledge be unlocked. That is what filled his heart with joy. I ask you, am I wrong? Was he not a minister of education? A minister of administration? I know my own children were the beneficiaries. They were Brownsville Bears, represent. Uh, <laughs> and I know they reaped the benefits of wonderful administration that David established there decades before they ever got there. In fact, I would bet that all of us gathered here are probably fairly ignorant to the countless hours that he gave to us. The many, many hours of his life that he gave to our community. Can you imagine passing a bond, building a school, finagling with county processes, finding budget to hire teachers, negotiate with unions, and, 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 and there's so much more. Why? To ensure that our children, all of our children in this community, that they might have access and opportunity when it comes to a sterling education. We do not know, but I bet his family does. And I know that Shannon does. I would say the most beautiful aspect of David's life that I've been able to witness since becoming his pastor, he loved her well. I'm not quite sure if I've ever seen a more beautiful portrait of love than when I would see David and Shanna walking down the hallway of our church to take their seats in the back. That is not Instagram love. That is Taj Mahal love. That is built for the ages. And their faithfulness and devotion to each other, to their family, and to God was nothing short of heroic. Our scripture says that his heart is firm. He trusts in the Lord. And that's who David and Shanna were in awe. Their faith is bedrock and stood firm in the midst of great difficulties, devastating losses, unwanted diagnosis, and yes, a stroke. I remember going over to see David in Seattle after that horrible stroke. And it's kind of hard to catch me, get me on my heels, but when I saw his incredible mind and that wonderful person that he was caught in a body that couldn't speak or couldn't move, it, it was unnerving. And I sat down and I grabbed his hand and I said, David, if I know anyone on the face of this earth who can beat this, it's you. And if I were a betting man, I bet that you will outperform every one of your doctor's expectations. And indeed he did. Why? 
because with David, hope sprung eternal. He has that indomitable spirit of hope. He had to. He was a Mariners fan. <laughs> <laughs> My kids need me. I have more in my life to give. The Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count the quality of God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in him before. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe that this verse was the secret sauce to David's remarkable integrity and his legacy in this community. As I said, Jesus Christ was his hero. Jesus Christ who enjoyed the presence of his Father in heaven, but looked down and saw a world bedraggled by sin, ravaged by pride and selfishness, a world thrown to evil and acrimony. And yet this world that needs, has everything that it needs to flourish, more than enough food to feed everyone, air and beauty, really this paradise, this beautiful gem in a very harsh galaxy. And yet we look and we know it's prone to futility. Things don't work as they should. People don't operate like they should. We have this universal sense that things could be better. And Paul says Jesus came to show us the way. Jesus humbled himself. Even though he had equality with God, he took on human flesh. Why? To serve us. To live for us. To die for us. And for those of us who are Christians, we look forward to the end of this month where we'll celebrate how he rose to life for us. Not because we earned it by good deeds, not because we you know, merited it because we're moral people, but simply from his grace. Simply because he seemed to be so happy. They, they, they seem to have an unquenchable thirst. One's building an underground bunker in Kauai. Is there anything more futile than building an underground bunker in Kauai? Why would you do that? <laughs> but Paul encourages us to do nothing from selfish ambition. Do nothing from vain conceit. Don't just look after yourself. Look after the needs of others. Remember others. Serve others. Love others. Put this mind, which is yours, in Jesus Christ. Let it rest upon you and see if God will do miracles in your life. See if God can change this broken culture and this broken world. The theme of our culture is, and now the end is near, and I face the final curtain, but thank God I did it my way. But the gospel demands that we say, how can I say thanks for all that? And our community is all the richer for He put in the hours, and we reap the dividends. New buildings, beautiful renovations, academic excellence, patient, gracious, listening ears. It was all driven by a desire to serve, that he might live a life of ministry that pleased his Lord. And indeed, he did live a life that is pleasing to Jesus. I would like believe that if David was here, he wouldn't like all this attention. <laughs>
But I do believe he would say, if you've seen anything admirable in me, anything lovely, it's due to how Jesus changed my life. If you see any indomitable hope in me, it is the hope that my Savior gave me. If you see any light in my eyes, well, that's Shem. And then his kids. And then Jesus. Oh, that we would be blessed. Make all things new. And he has made David new. But he promises to make you and me new if we'll let him. It's not by being a good person. It's not by trying to marry your way to heaven. It's really allowing him to come into your heart and to tie you. To get rid of those selfish ambitions. To get rid of those vain conceits. And he does this beautiful thing as he did in the life of David and Victor. He builds our character. He builds our integrity. So that he might give us a hope and a future and a purpose so that this world might look a little bit more lovely, a little bit more brighter, a little bit more like he created it to be. For those of us of the Christian faith, we believe that today is not goodbye, but it's until we meet again. And one day Jesus will call his own back into life in a world that is filled with people who desire to love a people. I'll close with this. I saw David. I believe it was, if it wasn't 24 hours, it was 48 hours before he passed away. And he stopped by the church. We were in a staff meeting. And he gave me an envelope. And in that little envelope was an incredibly generous gift to aid the victims of terror in Israel on October 7th, that horrible terrorist attack. One of the last moments of his life was to say to the hurting, you are not alone. Here is some help. How can I serve you? And I opened it up, and there was this beautiful note. Friend, all our love to you all. Shanna and David. If you ask me, that is the exclamation point to his life. A life devoted to love and service. What if? And so David, as the things of this earth grow strangely dim, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs receive you at your arrival and lead you into that holy city, <coughs> Jerusalem. May choirs of angels receive you with Lazarus once more. May you have eternal rest in the presence of eternal love for your eternal life with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we do pray that you would use us. Give us a purpose. Give us ministries. Help us to make this community a, a, a more beautiful place. A place that looks more like the way that you designed for it to be and for us to be. We thank you for the sterling examples that we have in David McVicker. And for those of us who knew him and loved him, we miss him. We pray, Lord, that you would send us more, that you would create more, because it was your power in David's life that brought the beauty of it. So help us to open our lives to you. Help us to give our lives to you, that one day, we might join with David around the throne of your glory and sing hallelujah, worthy is the Lamb, forever and ever and ever. Amen. 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 Would you join me as we close this great invite?
family leaves, uh, would just ask you to kind of stay there until they're on the way out. God bless you. Thank you.